the center of every courting ritual, there's a great unknown. How do we know when we've met someone we can love? How do we know the other person is actually who they seem to be? In the beginning, all we have to go on are surface appearances, which amount to a kind of hearsay. The question is how to get beyond them. Today we'll be discussing Shakespeare's Much Ado About Nothing, which seems to suggest that witty banter is more than just good fun, and has an important role to play in getting to know others. This is Wes Alwyn. And this is Aaron Olanik. And you're listening to Subtext. So Much Ado About Nothing. We'll give a brief summary of the play, and then we will get into our analysis. So the plot is about two couples, Beatrice and Benedict and Hero and Claudio. Hero is a girl's name, odd girl's name. After a, a battle, there's a, a good Don Pedro, who's the Prince of Aragon, and his brother, his bastard brother, the sort of evil Don John. After this battle, they come to Messina with two officers, Claudio and Benedict. And Claudio, sort of young, very much the um, like an ingenue, but a man. So Claudio is young and sort of maybe sort of foolish. And he sees Hero and instantly falls in love with her. And Benedict runs into Beatrice, Hero's cousin, who is possibly an old girlfriend. There's some bitterness there. And the two of them hate each other. And they have this merry war betwixt them, which they are constantly engaging in, like a battle of wits, where they're putting each other down. So Benedict, he's a bachelor. He never wants to get married, says he hates women. And so he tries to talk Claudio out of marrying Hero, but a wedding is arranged. It's going to happen in a week. And it's such a long time to wait. So Don Pedro needs something to do because he's bored waiting the week until the wedding. So Don Pedro decides to make Beatrice and Benedict fall in love. He thinks there's a spark there. So he arranges for Benedict to overhear his friends talking about Beatrice's unrequited love for Benedict. And he arranges for Beatrice to overhear her friends talking about how Benedict is in love with her. And the plan works. The two of them sort of fall in love, but they don't really openly acknowledge it yet. Meanwhile, the evil Don John, he has his own plot. And for reasons that we never really learn, which we could talk about later, he decides that he's going to break up Claudio and Hero before the wedding. So he, he arranges for his man, Baraccio, or Baraccio, to have a tryst with Margaret, who's Hero's chambermaid, who I suppose sort of looks like Hero, on the eve of the wedding. And for Claudio to walk by and to see Baraccio and Margaret sort of in flagrante. And it works. Claudio sees them and thinks that Margaret is an unchaste Hero, having sex with another man on the night before their wedding. So he waits till the wedding the next day, of course, at a public place and denounces Hero right before they're supposed to get married and then storms off with Don Pedro. And the friar performing the ceremony, he believes that Hero is actually innocent. And so he tells her family to fake Hero's death and that this will make Claudio remorseful and then the truth will come out about about her true character. And luckily, there's a foolish watchman, one of Shakespeare's fools, uh, Dogberry watchman of the city who overheard Boreccio discussing Don John's evil plot. And so Dogberry gets Boreccio to confess that the whole thing was a setup. And Claudio is guilt-stricken and still thinking that Hero is dead. He agrees to marry a cousin who he's never met, but is told looks just like Hero. And they go to the church to be wed. The bride is unmasked. And lo and behold, it's Hero and the happy couple get married, and then Beatrice and Benedict simultaneously finally publicly admit their love for each other. And Benedict turns to Don Pedro and says, get thee a wife. So he's finally become, as you could say, pro-marriage. And uh, that's it. Very good. Thank you. So you like what production that's... So of the things that are available on video or, or film versions, was it the Brana version that you liked? It is, yes. It's a little over the top, a little corny, but that is my favorite version that I've seen. And I've seen a lot of them. I've seen the 84 BBC version. I've seen the the more recent version with David Tennant. Oh, okay. And a couple of others besides. And there's the Joss Whedon. I think I saw part of that, but not the whole thing. I know some people who are big fans of that, but I didn't see the whole thing. Not because I didn't like it. I don't remember what was going on. But anyway, the Branagh one with Emma Thompson, I think 
hits the right note for me, being the war between Beatrice and Benedict seems more jovial than in the 84 version. In the 84 version, they're sniping at each other a little bit more. It's a little more tense. Yeah, I have to say, I really actually prefer the 84 BBC version. I tend to prefer those in general for Shakespeare plays. They're really wonderful. BBC, The BBC basically went through and did a, I wouldn't call them film versions, but videotaped versions of every one of Shakespeare's plays. And like I said, I almost always prefer those to any other production. And unfortunately, by comparison, once I <laughs> watch those, I'm not, a, I'm not a fan of Brano's productions. He definitely has the um, celebrity casting issue in a lot of his Shakespearean productions where they tend to be sometimes pretty laughable. I mean, the Keanu Reeves, Don John is, that's actually one of the reasons why I love that version so much, though. I do his eat when I have stomach speech. I do a pretty good impression of his, his <laughs> halting recital of that speech. Um, so that's part of the appeal for me is that the whole thing is kind of silly. I think it still works. But in terms of a, a straight version that has all of the dialogue in the play, certainly the 84 version is more complete. Yeah. And I prefer the acting and just, just basically everything. But yeah, for the moment, the way the Branagh film, the way it starts, you've got very dramatically Don Pedro and Claudio and the whole gang are riding their horses up to Messina and everyone's in a very jolly mood except for Don John, you know, except for Keanu Reeves, who's just scowling already. <laughs> <laughs> From the very, very early on, we're going to get introduced to Beatrice and her sharp tongue. One of the things I wanted to mention at the very beginning, because I think this is something to talk about, is the role of metaphor in the play because it plays such an important role in the wittiness, the witty banter between Beatrice and Benedict, which I think has some deeper significance. And then I think as we'll see, it plays a role in the way people think in general and the way that they are so quick to jump to conclusions about guilt and innocence, for instance, about hero's guilt. So one good illustration of this happens early on. Of course, these plays are just chock full of metaphor and figurative stuff, but this is a good example of how it works and why it's important. So line 25, first scene, first act, the soldiers have returned and the messenger is praising Don Pedro. And then Leonardo says he has an uncle here in Messina who's going to be very happy to hear all that. And then the messenger, so this is actually back at line 20, says... I've already delivered him letters, and there appears much joy in him, even so much that joy could not show itself modest enough without a badge of bitterness. Which is to say, he was crying with joy. But what's really interesting about this particular metaphor is that the crying, it gives an explanation of what it means to cry for joy. So the idea is that there's something immodest about joyfulness unless it's been alloyed, adulterated with some sign of its opposite. And so you get this idea that joy is personified and joy is feeling modest and so must hide itself behind a little bit of bitterness. And Leonardo gets the message and says, did he, meaning Don Pedro's uncle, break out into tears? And the messenger says in great measure, here's the more illustrative metaphor Leonardo says, a kind overflow of kindness. There are no faces truer than those that are so washed. How much better is it to weep at joy than to joy at weeping? I wanted to bring this up because one of the functions of these metaphors in the play is actually explanation. There's a hint of that in the example I just gave with the messenger, but here it's more clear. And it's that the sort of surface level, the abstract level thing is to say there's this connection between honesty and grief. That someone who expresses the emotion of grief, that in a way is a sign of their trustworthiness. So there are no faces truer than those that are so washed. At the metaphorical level, right, is just that being untrustful would mean to be dirty and tears wash that dirt away. One of the functions of metaphor is to give this very sensory, visceral sense of something that's abstract, right? You get, instead of trustworthiness and untrustworthiness, you get a washed face versus an unwashed face. 
But the other thing here is it's really, it's about a mechanism. So you identify, you're saying, why are people who show that emotion more trustworthy? At a surface level, that's a very complex question. At the deeper metaphorical level, you identify a mechanism, right, which, um, which corresponds to something that we, we're probably not even sure how we can describe. So the idea of something, of tears washing the face, it becomes a placeholder for the more complex psychology of how one might relate grief to trust. And it also gives us a sense of having explained something or having demonstrated something, having proved something. And I think I wanted to give that set up because when we get to the way all that stuff works in the witty exchange between Benedict and Beatrice, and there are other, other witty exchanges in the play, but anyway, it'll have a slightly different role. I think there's something there too in you pointing out that particular metaphor about these contradictory emotions coexisting. That's certainly a, a recurring theme, not just in the language of the play, but also in the plot of the play, which coalesces these two plots that are sort of moving in opposite directions in terms of, you know, one toward love and the other against it. The sort of shocking event that happens in the middle of all of this, which is the confrontation at the wedding. And the the sense for me anyway that that scene is and perhaps this is exacerbated in the in the Brano version because it's such a jolly adaptation it's it's not so out of place in the eighty four version that that scene is so heightened in its tragedy that it, it seems to be misplaced in such a lighthearted comedy. I mean the moment at which Beatrice says to Benedict that he has to kill Claudio to avenge Hero is pretty crazy. They're just a lot of extremes going on in the play that sometimes I forget that that happens. And something that makes Beatrice, I think, such a complex character is, is the fact that she's constantly employing these metaphors of contradictory emotional states in order to describe how she's feeling. She goes from one extreme to another and then says, well, you know, I'm somewhere in the middle, but here's one extreme and here's another. And she uses them as vehicles for metaphors quite often. The way that often works is you can use metaphor to get a contradictory meaning out of the surface meaning, and the wit often will work that way. So here's a good exchange. On 135, Act 1, Scene 1, they're at it. This is at the very end of the exchange, but Benedict says, I would my horse had the speed of your tongue, and so good a continuer. Where continuer is a horse that has stamina. I would my horse had the speed of your tongue and so good a continuer, but keep your way, O God's name, I have done. And she says, you always end with a jade's trick. I know you of old. Which is an interesting line. The jade's trick part is the jade is a horse that will find devious ways to unseat its rider. So she's accusing him of basically ducking out of the game of wits. And just thinking about the way all that works is he's basically initiated this metaphor of the horse and then she will extend it in some way. So often the way that these games of wit works is the other person will extend the metaphor to the other person's detriment. So he's trying to insult her with this horse comparison and she turns it on him by, in a way it's an extension, it's not precise, but by extending the metaphor and making it encompass him. Benedict says on just a few lines earlier, 129, God keep your ladyship still in that mind, so some gentleman or other shall scape a predestinate scratched face. Right. Yeah, so if some guy came near you, then he would get a scratched face trying to woo you. And she comes back with a sort of sing-songy line of scratching could not make it worse and were such a face as yours were, right? Well, <laughs> well, you, you're pretty ugly. So then he takes that and it takes the sort of sing-song quality of that or parroting back his own words to him and says, well, you are a rare parrot teacher, right? Meaning just a speaker of stupid, monotonous nonsense. And she responds to that by saying, well, a bird of my tongue is better than a beast of yours. So she's borrowed the bird imagery from him and given him back a, a beast for his bird. And then in response to that, he has the horse comparison. Perhaps that beast made him think of the horse and says he wishes that it had the speed of her tongue and then drops out. I have done. And she then continues his horse metaphor by saying, well, you always end with a jade's trick. And then this mysterious line, which speaks volumes in five words, I know you of old. So I think that's the first time that we get the sense that perhaps they had not just prior knowledge of each other, but perhaps a past relationship where he used a jade's trick. <laughs> 
ambiguous between, you know, they've been playing this game of wits for a while, which we know they have, but it says maybe there was something more than just that. Part of what's interesting here to me is just if it weren't wit, it would just be insults and it wouldn't be interesting and it wouldn't be smart, right? So if mm-hmm. he said you talk too much and he were simply to call her a shrew and someone who was repetitive and talk too much and then she were to say you're a coward, all of that, of course, would be really uninteresting. It's what they can do with the imagery, which in a way is almost like a demonstration of their point, right? Because the subtext of all of it is that they're demonstrating each other's bad qualities and the ability to display wit to construct these metaphors is taken as a kind of surrogate for whether or not they have those qualities. So just by being clever enough to turn the horse metaphor on him, it's a way to sort of tag his discontinuation of the conversation with the label of cowardice. Whether or not there is really cowardice, it doesn't matter. It's not that she's identified cowardice, is calling him on it exactly. It's she proves it in a way by getting in the last blow and by displaying the kind of formidable wit which would make someone run away. And this is what makes them so well suited to each other, not just the fact that they're able to do this with their wit to sort of continue the metaphor and so have a kind of more of a tennis match between them than just slapping each other down with insults, but also the fact that no one else in the play talks like this. They use metaphors, but they don't talk at this level of wit and they don't turn their metaphors toward each other as as a kind of a dagger. There's a little bit of it between him and his bros and between the ladies. When Hero's about to get married, for instance, there's a little bit of verbal repartee between her and Margaret and Beatrice. (laughs) Yeah. Yes. And this is something that's sort of a common conceit in like screwball comedies of the 30s and 40s for which much ado is kind of the blueprint is that the main characters, no matter how much they may fight with each other, have to be together because they're the only ones who understand each other's inside jokes or something, are able to keep up with them at this level of speed and and intelligence. And so that taking what the other person says and adapting it to one's own ends, it's used to sort of injure the other person, but, but it also requires a certain amount of, I don't know, to coin a phrase, maybe like verbal empathy you know where the person is going and he's passing you the football and then you're taking it and and doing what you want with it and then passing it back to them. That's really, yeah, that's actually very interesting. It's a kind of a cooperative endeavor. Right. It's a competition, but it it takes two to (laughs) to tango to keep it going. The example I wish I'd used, hopefully I'm not belaboring this by giving another example, but when she first sees him and says, I wonder that you will still be talking, Senor Benedict. No one marks you. Which, of (laughs) course, she's marking him in that. And there's a lot of the subtext of their interest in fighting with each other, of course, is the idea that they're romantically interested in each other and that this is a cover for all that. Anyway, Benedict says, What, my dear Lady Disdain? Are you yet living? So Lady Disdain, capital. So he's personifying her as Disdain itself. Beatrice, is it possible Disdain should die? while she has such meat food to feed it as Senior Benedict. So that back and forth, where they're feeding each other, so to speak, little figurative language. So the, the cooperative effort is to keep extending the metaphor. That's the cooperative part of it, is the way in which they elaborate the image. And it's not a mere comparison. It's something that becomes structurally much more complicated. So if it's just her being personified as Lady Disdain, okay, that's fine. But once you elaborate that picture and now she's eating Senior Benedict, you're creating a much richer picture and it's something, a picture that they have to create together. Right. This is a continuation too of her, which I I didn't maybe realize until now, that she immediately brings up having such meat food to feed it as Senior Benedict after she's just remarked to Leonardo and and the messenger and and hero and everybody standing around. She's been bad-mouthing him before he even arrives saying, I pray you, how many have he killed and eaten in these wars? But how many have he killed? For indeed, I promise to eat all of his killing. She started with this joke about how inept he must be at at battle or something that she was going to eat all the people that he killed. Makes the remark about the musty victual and he hath hope to eat it. He hath an excellent stomach. There are all these stomach jokes, eating jokes. And then as soon as he gets there, she's ready to take it up with him. Continue the food metaphor now that he's 
finally there to fill what she's been getting at. And then it takes off from there. It's a telling metaphor because it combines the sort of the aggressive element with the potential libidinal element, right? Food is something that gives you pleasure and to eat something and devour it. Just thinking back on this image of her as Lady Disdain and eating him is a very sensual thing. And on the other hand, of course, it's about to eat something is also to destroy what you're getting pleasure from. And that's one of the underlying dangers, I think, you know, love is, as it will turn out in this play, love is actually very dangerous. We know why. I mean, what part of it is it's about being the possibility that one might be betrayed, that the person that you love isn't what they seem to be. You can only note them. You can only, in a way, their appearances, their outer signs, their supposed modesty of behavior, for instance, or mannerisms are just a kind of hearsay. You know, I think... Beatrice and Benedict are obviously on guard against it for a reason. The hostility in their relationship, it's cautious on the one hand, right? It indicates that there's a real attraction. You know, I think that's just in the same way in the screwball comedies that you're talking about or in this play, we read it immediately as, okay, they're really into each other and they're defending against that, but they have a good reason to defend. And in in a way, it might be the better path than what happens with Claudio and Hero, where Claudio immediately falls in love with her, and then we see how dangerous that can be. We see that that quickness to love can lead to life and death sorts of circumstances. Though it's clear that, not to belabor the the eating metaphor, but I mean, I I think one of the reasons why Beatrice starts with that before Benedict even, even arrives on the scene, when she's just heard that he is to be coming is presumably he's been away for quite a while in the war. And she seems, in fact, to be starving for his presence and perhaps for this battle between them to continue because I think that she gets some kind of pleasure out of it, some sort of satisfaction that she's she's obviously not getting with any other man because she's sort of gentle with Don Pedro and most of the other men except for Claudio when he wrongs Hero. Or she's more gentle anyway. Everything seems to be directed toward Benedict, which makes me wonder if this reticence or this hatred of love and this desire not to get entangled in love has something to do with their past history and maybe the the younger versions of themselves as being something like Claudio and Hero. You know, something has Mm. put Benedict off women. The idea of being a a cuckold is an image that repeatedly comes up Mm -hmm. and seems to be something that Benedict is wary of being. So, of course, is Claudio given reason later to be wary of being cuckolded? And so it makes me wonder if Benedict and Beatrice, a little older, a little sadder, a little wiser, are sort of the later versions of Claudio and Hero who maybe went through something like this themselves. It's interesting to think about what role this sort of witty repartee ought to play in a relationship or some sort of equivalent of it instead of just being in the sort of unmediated Claudio hero situation where it's love at first sight and they just, they want to, seems like, merge with each other. That kind of love, we might think of it as a threat to individuality. It might look like it could be suffocating beyond the dangers of being betrayed by someone, right? And one of the other factors is just being altered by love. There are lots of clues in this play that one of the scary things about it is having one's relationship to oneself altered, having one's identity altered, being kind of transformed by it into someone else, and the question of whether you have actually lost yourself in that. And I think the wit can be a way to set up a certain kind of boundary, set up a a way to try and maintain a individuality in the face of relatedness. Of course, you know, in the beginning, Benedict and Beatrice are going too far At some point, I forget who says it, but someone says, you know, if only you could get someone midway between Claudio and Benedict. The part I'm thinking of in relationship to what you're saying is Act 2, Scene 1. Yep, that's where it is. To me, this is her treatise about, like, not being a joiner, you know? (laughs) She wants to stand apart from everyone. Nothing will satisfy her. I think you're right. It it comes from this fear of her need to maintain her individuality. I suppose we could take a step back and consider the fact also that Beatrice is has an uncle as a guardian. She doesn't have any parents that we know of. She's Hero's cousin. And so Leonardo's, I guess, charge 
she has no parents to worry about her or to help her fake her own death should something like what happens to Hero happen to her. And so she sort of stands alone and has this kind of freedom that is unique to her, whereas Hero is much more the young ingenue who is still under the protection of her father. So Beatrice doesn't have that. And then she sort of gives her treatise on how she could never be with a man because she's not right for a certain type of man and another type of man isn't right for her. She is comparing and contrasting, again, these two extremes. So she starts out by making fun of Don John and says, how tartly that gentleman looks. I never can see him, but I am heartburned an hour after. And that's act two, scene one, line three and four. This is exactly the line I was thinking of where Beatrice said, he were an excellent man that were made just in the midway between John Don and Benedict. Yeah. She notes that Don John is sour looking and doesn't say anything. So the one is too like an image and says nothing. And the other too like my lady's eldest son, ever more tattling. (laughs) So, So one never speaks like a painting and the other is like an obnoxious little boy, always, always talking. So she gives these two extremes and then... Leonardo responds, then half Signor Benedict's tongue in Count John's mouth and half Count John's melancholy in Signor Benedict's face. So if he would talk half as much as Benedict and be half as serious as Don John, and then Beatrice says, yeah, you know, with a good leg and a good foot, uncle, and money enough in his purse. So sure, you know, if he has if he has all these other great qualities too, such a man would win any woman in the world if he could get her goodwill. Hmm. So he could be a perfect man and all he would need is to get the woman's good opinion. Right. So because presumably having these things wouldn't automatically give him her good opinion. Right. And then again, it's this masterpiece of not this and not that, not this extreme and not the other extreme. So Leonardo warns her that she'll never get a husband if she's so shrewd of thy tongue, so so sharp tongued. And Antonio agrees she's too cursed. She's too, I suppose, shrewish. Cantankerous. Well, too cursed is more than cursed, right? So it sort of cancels itself out. So then I'm not cursed because I'm too cursed. So it's more than cursed. She says, to God sends a cursed cow short horns, but to a cow too cursed, he sends none. Again, with the cuckold imagery. Mm -hmm. So she says, well, God gives an ill-tempered cow short horns, essentially, right? But to a cow that is too ill-tempered, well, he doesn't send anything. There's nothing about a cow being what happens to a cow that's too ill-tempered. So I could not endure a husband with a beard on his face. I had rather lie in the woolen. And so then Leonardo said, you may light on a husband that hath no beard. But Beatrice says, what should I do with him? <laughs> Dress him in my apparel and make him my waiting gentlewoman? He that hath a beard is more than a youth, and he that hath no beard is less than a man. And he that is more than a youth is not for me, and he that is less than a man, I am not for him. Therefore, I will even take sixpence in earnest of the bear of the Berard, Berard, Berward, Berward, and lead his apes into hell. So she won't take a man with a beard, and she won't take a man with no beard, and she's not cursed like a cow. She's too cursed, so she has no horn. So, th- so there's no place for her. I think that some of this actually, d- toward the end, it takes on some pathos where she decides that she has no place. She's neither here nor there, and perhaps maybe wishes that she did have a place underneath it. But that's me reading too much into Beatrice's psyche. Yeah, there's this idea of of leading the apes to hell, which is something to do with being a spinster. A proverbial idea that spinsters were doomed to lead apes into hell as a punishment for not reproducing, basically, where Mm -hmm. the apes are sort of variants on children. And then there's the talk about her being Leonardo jokes, what, you're going to go to hell? And she says, no. Well, deliver them up, and then the devil will say, get thee to heaven, and she will go to heaven and (laughs) sit near the bachelors and be as merry as the day is long. But there's another part where she talks about never going into the world or something like that. I was trying to get at your idea that maybe there's a little undercurrent of melancholy in her situation. Mm. Well, I mean, I think the very fact that she takes such pleasure out of out of Benedict's company, I mean, it may be a sick pleasure, but there, <laughs> there's some pleasure there. Maybe it's the self-deprecating humor that makes me think that. I'm always fascinated by the random proposal that Don Pedro makes to Beatrice. Yeah. Still in Act 2, Scene 1. And starting around line 310, Don Pedro says, In faith, lady, you have a merry heart. 
And she says, yea, my lord, I thank it, poor fool. It keeps on the windy side of care. I think that's so sad. She really reveals herself to him. And I think that that's what inspires his sudden half-hearted proposal that he makes her because he sees this tender, regretful side of her. And she says, thus goes everyone to the world but I, and I am sunburnt. I may sit in a corner and cry, hey ho, for a husband. So that's quite different from being led to the corner where the bachelors sit. Right. She's in the corner alone. And again, he, yeah, Don Pedro accuses her twice of being merry and she shuts him down twice. He says later, you were born in a merry hour. And she responds, no, sure, my lord, my mother cried. But then there was a star danced and under that was I born. So there's this mixture of pain and delight in her, which seems very pronounced in that scene. One thing that I, I'm not sure I understand is why Don Pedro has to woo Hero on Claudio's behalf. Yeah, I've never understood that either. <laughs> it doesn't make any sense. I mean, there's a lot going on between Hero and Claudio that doesn't make too much logical sense. But Don Pedro offers himself to woo Hero for Claudio. We discover the, the fault in Claudio's character, distrust of people, early on, because Don John is able to convince him in this moment that even though Don Pedro has said, I'll woo her for you, and they make this plan, um, Don John is still able to convince Claudio that Don Pedro is going to take Hero for himself. And Claudio immediately accepts what Don John says and says, oh no, Don Pedro is taking Hero for himself. And immediately those fears are put to rest when Don Pedro sort of hands Hero over Right, and then they forget about that, and they will believe Don John the second <laughs> time he comes around with. Right, that they've learned nothing about this sour-faced man who gives people heartburn just by looking at him. There's already been a falling out, right, between Don John and Don Pedro, and Don Pedro has sort of accepted Don John back into the fold. So, I mean, it seems like it's well known that he's untrustworthy, and then if it weren't well known, it should be obvious after this one incident and yet Don John is able to rile them up again, instigate something. So it's really odd because it seems just to work to undermine the plot. And Don John is such an odd figure in and of himself. I mean, what motivates his misanthropic behavior throughout this whole play? Except that he, well, he's a bastard. I think that's the... Well, right. So he was always treated badly. And he says at some point that he does this essentially because he does it. Where's that speech of his? So I think... Act two, scene two. Scene two, yeah. Or scene three, even. I cannot hide what I am. I must be sad when I have cause and smile at no man's jest, eat when I have stomach and wait for no man's leisure, sleep when I am drowsy and tend on no man's business, laugh when I am merry and claw no man in his humor. And he says a few lines down, I'd rather be a canker in a hedge than a rose in his grace. And it better fits my blood to be disdained of all than to fashion a carriage to rob love from any. I am but a, a plain-dealing plain dealing villain. villain. <laughs> well, that's convenient. He knows what he is, and, and now we know. Yeah, so he stands out in a, in a way, so he's antisocial. You know, he's the foil for the natural deceptiveness of social life. Things are not necessarily as appear, right? So people's, there's a lot in this play about fashion and apparel, and again, about the difference between the sort of signs that people give off, so heroes, Later on, we'll, we'll have a speech about the blot on Hero's character, despite the fact that she gave all these outward signs of modesty, including blushing, including her, the graceful way she behaved. So there's that. And this, this is, again, part of what's dangerous about love is this, it's kind of an epistemological or an epistemic predicament where what we have are signifiers or signs, and we don't know exactly we know what they seem to represent, but we can't know for sure. Someone might not be who they represent themselves as being. But on the other hand, the example of the person, it doesn't quite line up because Don John is obviously deceptive. But there is a sense in which he's plain dealing because he wears his, his unhappiness on his sleeve. He doesn't hide it. He doesn't put on a jolly face. His misanthropy is, is apparent. So in the one person where that there isn't that sharp division between an inner life and sort of outer niceties, outer people being polite when they may not feel that way on the inside, uh, he's the foil to that. Though he's expressed that he is a plain dealing villain, it's almost as though he's too straightforward to be believed. 
that the other characters, you know, Claudio and, and so easily accepts whatever he tells him. I'm trying to say something about society as and not not accepting anything on its face or the power of gossip that hearsay and, and suggestion seem to be the only things that are taken as truth. Mm -hmm. That character, that the outward evidence of character doesn't seem to matter much, but what people say is someone else's character, that does matter. And the power of gossip often overrides what is what is evident to everyone. Not just that, though, but that the outer appearances, in a way, are a kind of hearsay. So when I think of this, the much ado is all this activity based on hearsay, and it's basically love and hate. It's inducing Beatrice and Benedict to love each other and inducing Claudio to scorn Hero. Ultimately, what the nothing and the noting really come down to are the inaccessibility of other people's interiors to us and the fact that we're, we're always in some sense relying on hearsay when we observe their behaviors. So at the wedding, this really horrible scene, so Act 4, Scene 1, Line 55, Claudia makes a lot of the difference between Hero's outward appearance and who she turns out to be. So it's in Line 30. Give not this rotten orange to your friend. She's but the sign and semblance of her honor. Behold how like a maid she blushes here. Oh, what authority and show of truth. Can cunning sin cover itself with all? Comes not that blood is modest evidence to witness simple virtue. Would you not swear all that you see her that she were a maid by these exterior shows? But she is none. She knows the heat of a luxurious bed. Her blush is guiltiness, not modesty. So in this case, the sign, the outward sign, like blushing, right? It's a way to know the interior, except it's polyvalent. There's an ambiguity. So you don't know, actually, what seemed to be modesty might turn out to be guilt. You know, and then later on, he'll say, around 78, he wants to make her answer truly to her name. And then, when the friar comes in, he's going to be involved in the same sort of interpretation of outward signs. And this is around line 158. And the word noting actually comes up. And given way unto this course of fortune, by noting of the lady... I have marked a thousand blushing apparitions to start into her face, a thousand innocent shames. In angel whiteness beat away those blushes. In her eye there hath appeared a fire to burn the errors that these princes hold against her maiden truth. Call me a fool, trust not my reading nor my observations, which with experimental seal doth warrant the tenor of my book, trust not my age, and so on. What they're ultimately talking about is the kind of hearsay that outward appearances are. And I think there are different categories of outward appearance. The appearance. Some of it is just what people say, right? The promises they make, what's explicitly in their speech. Some of it is about when he talks about her graces or when he sees, when it's love at first sight, when he's observing her in the garden. Some of that is about femininity and very subtle mannerisms that mark off femininity from masculinity and seem to be something, I don't know how to describe it, but something wonderful and desirable and inherently modest and whatever other attributes you might want to give to that. And then there's the kind of body language that the friar is reading, which he takes on his experience to be more accurate. So he's saying, look, I'm an experienced observer of people. And if you looked at her reactions through this whole trial, then you would see that she's not guilty. So it all comes back, I think, to the concept of hearsay, we can expand it. And love actually heightens the, it raises the stakes on figuring out who people are and distinguishing mere gossip, whether it's actually just gossip socially or whether it's the way they present themselves from who they actually are. And I think ultimately, by the way, wit is one way of getting through that barrier. That's what Beatrice and Benedict actually have that's important. It's a way of erecting a barrier, not getting too close, using aggression to kind of keep each other at a distance. But it's also, we talked about the way it becomes a project that they're embarking on, that they're cooperating on. I, I think you're right that, that love raises the stakes of this. I was thinking of character assassination. It's a death through gossip that then Hero acts out herself. But I was thinking of the literal assassination in, I, I was just rereading Macbeth recently, when Duncan is betrayed by the first Thane of Cawdor at the very beginning of the play, 
and he complains to Macbeth, there's no art to find the mind's construction in the face or something mm. like that. He was a gentleman on whom I built an absolute trust. And he's complaining about this to Macbeth, who he who is now the, the new Thane of Cawdor, who he's convinced is such a wonderful, loyal guy and who is already planning to murder him. But yeah, there's no art to find the mind's construction in the face. So Duncan, despite his age and wisdom, lacks the ability of the friar here to be able to see something and, and make a judgment from experience about Hero. But I mean, I think you're right that the stakes are so high here because... We should say, what is right. so dangerous about love? I think there are a number of things, but part of it is just obvious, right? It's the idea of being betrayed and her being unchaste. But then, you know, we could say a little more about the psychology of why does that even matter? Why does it matter whether she's known another's bed and things like that? At an emotional level, it's obvious to us. But if we try to say, if we try to parse those things out, it becomes a little bit more complicated. Perhaps it's useful to come at it through the, I mean, I don't know if you saw this. It's something that I came about in my outside reading. The sort of dirty pun on nothing. The no thing, right. <laughs> which is the... Elizabethan slang for female genitalia. Right, right. She doesn't have a thing. There is nothing there. But that in itself is is sort of interesting, right? Because it's, I mean, not, not to be totally disgusting here, but it's something that you can fill, <laughs> fill with your own um, imagination, right. if you will, right. right? So the idea that one's sort of blushing with modesty could also be a sort of levitious reddening with, with sensuality, it is the thing most open to interpretation, that there's not necessarily some sort of outward sign that a woman is interested sexually in someone and therefore she's the image of the of the woman the idealized woman is one on whom you can hang um any kind of male ideal or aspiration mm -hmm. and whether or not she actually holds up to that is what is so consequential here that claudio has decided that she is something and has found that that something is nothing, or is convinced of that anyway. So the fact that she is virginal, that she is the empty person to whom he can provide the, the fulfillment, is necessary for him to be satisfied. Yeah, there's all this talk of being stained or besmirched at the end. She needs to be a blank canvas in a way for him to, for her to be the sort of mirror. I think your idea of projecting is good. Some of it is about that you be the only object of their desire. But I think some of it is about the way in which people affect each other and shape each other in those relationships such that for her to have been altered and shaped by someone else in their own image makes her an imperfect companion. And in a way, it makes her an imperfect mirror there's something in lovers i think they want to see themselves in their lover there's a kind of narcissism to love in which you feel yourself amplified by finding someone hey, they're just like me and that's what i love about them i'm trying to get at some of the psychology of what motivates this terror at her not being pure it's the pygmalion myth the idea that you are the one who makes the woman so I was thinking about some of the fear about love is the way in which there's this idea of losing ourselves. And actually the way Leonardo puts it when he's upset over his belief about who Hero is, this is at 135, or maybe we go back a little more, 131. Why had I not with charitable hands took up a beggar's issue at my gates, who smirched thus and mired with infamy, I might have said, no part of it is mine. This shame derives itself from unknown loins. But mine and mine I loved and mine I praised and mine that I was proud on, mine so much that I myself was to myself not mine valuing of her. Mm. Why she, oh, she is fallen into a pit of ink that the wide sea hath dropped too few to wash her clean again and salt too little which may season give to her foul tainted flesh. So yeah, this idea that you become not your own by loving. And that's one of the dangers. Beatrice and Benedict are part of the function of their aggressive, witty banner is to remain possessed of themselves. So this whole idea of reading these outward signs of people and trying to figure out who they are, 
Well, there's something that's obviously much superior to that, which is just going through some sort of getting to know you process. <laughs> the dating, which uh, <laughs> I guess there's no real mechanism for that back then, except for the kind of thing that Beatrice and Benedict are doing. So, you know, you use this idea of a test. They're putting each other to a test of wits. In a way, it's almost like hazing, right? So they're seeing how much punishment the other person can take. They're investigating each other's intelligence. They're learning, you know, you learn about what another person knows, you know, learn about what they value. You learn all sorts of things from engaging in that game of wits. And that is part of what's missing in the whole Claudio hero, love at first sight, let's get married thing. One other thing I wanted to mention with respect to this passage is just, again, the way metaphor works. This goes towards the whole, another distinction about wit, you know, this part on 140. There's, you know, there's not enough salt in the sea to season her foul tainted flesh, which is a disgusting, <laughs> you know, she's become inedible because she's gone bad. And he switches from the idea that you can't wash her clean with the ocean to the ocean doesn't contain enough salt to make her tasty now. This is another strange connection with Macbeth. I'm thinking of, no, rather, I would, I would the multitude seas and carnadine making the green one red, right? If I put my hand in all of the seas of the world, it couldn't wash off the stain of what I had done. Rather, it would, it would dye the sea red. Mm. It's that same image here, which is just so funny because it's a, a literal assassination and character assassination are using the same terminology. But later on, just a little bit down the page, again, we see washing it with tears, that same metaphor down in 150, where the two princes lie and Claudio lie who loved her so that speaking of her foulness washed it with tears. How could they be lying if they were crying and saying it? Exactly what he says that you pointed out at the beginning. Yeah, and this is actually really important. It goes towards the point I, was, I wanted to make here, which is that, again, the way the metaphor is working and the way they get extended, it becomes a kind of proof. It's almost like it's something that's admissible in court. It's affecting people's thinking. To talk about who Hero is and her behaviors in a more abstract way would introduce a lot more nuance, right? And it might occur to them, well, wait a minute, Beatrice said she was with her every night but one, so the entire story doesn't hold up because the idea that she was, had been with her lover many, many, many times, and not just that one time. To think about people outside of these very visual, sensual metaphors being meat to be eaten or being tainted or blotted and all this stuff, you have to, again, there's a nothing sort of at the center of that way of talking because other people's souls are intangible and we can't touch and see and feel what's inside them. Their subjects, their desires and their psyches are hidden to us. And if we were to talk about their guilt and innocence, we'd have to talk about that with a lot of nuance. And we're also talking in a way about you know, if we're talking about our character, we're talking about our estimation of what happens in the future. The ways in which she's disposed to behave. Is she going to be faithful? Is she not? And again, these invisible things, you know, what's the nature of her character? Is she a bad person? This and that. But again, in, in some more nuanced way where it's not just all good and all bad, but you'd get into some very complex assessment of her psychology. But it's much more satisfying just to say... She's blotted, she's smirched. You think in, some, in a way it's very visual, very sensual. It reduces these abstractions and, or the invisibility of the soul or the psyche to something that's tangible. And you'll see that you know, if you look at the metaphors in this play or in general, you'll see that that happens a lot. They function to anchor thinking about something that's a nothing, that's something that's more invisible and that's abstract. So you put it in the metaphor, but the result of that is that they become convincing, right? So the whole idea that, well, this kind of maxim that people who are sad are more honest, or if you see them in a state of sadness, that's evidence of their honesty. But relying on this idea that tears wash the dirt, the metaphorical dishonesty off the face, you're describing a mechanism in, in a way there. And it's almost like a pseudo-scientific explanation. It gives the appearance of being an explanation, and it becomes convincing. And so the way in which they are thinking about Hero's guilt and jumping to that conclusion so quickly is predicated on this use of metaphor. It, it's very, again, it's something that it's like pseudo-evidence. 
these underlying images almost become evidentiary. It's almost like I observed it, I saw it. And even the way in which Margaret stands in for Hero in the window is an enactment of metaphor. So I wanted to contrast the way it's used in wit. So in wit, someone who's being witty isn't beholden to the metaphor. They're constructing it and using it, and they know not to take it as evidence, right? So when someone says to Beatrice, oh, you're having a battle of wits, and she says, yes, but four of them limped off and he's only got one and this and that, she's giving this insulting characterization of of him, right? And it lies in perfect parallel to these insulting characterizations of hero, but it's bracketed. She's just ribbing him, right? She doesn't take her own creation as if it were a real thing. And that's one of the things that wit, as a way for them to get to know each other, it allows this expression of aggression and some of these paranoid and horrible feelings without taking them so seriously, taking them at face value. So there are two sort of physical metaphors for hero. The first is is Margaret, and then the second is dead hero. The idea that she's dead and and the the friar's explanation for how this will happen is, you know, this great deception. He says this is in the same scene, let's see, line 215 around there. For so it falls out that what we have we prize not to the worth whilst we enjoy it, but being lacked and lost, why then we rack the value, then we find the virtue that possession would not show us whilst it was ours. So it will fare with Claudio. When he shall hear she died upon his words, the idea of her life shall sweetly creep into his study of imagination, and every lovely organ of her life shall come unparalleled in more precious habit, more moving, delicate, and full of life into the eye and prospect of his soul than when she lived indeed. Then shall he mourn. Then shall he mourn if ever love had interest in his liver and wished he had not so accused her. So by taking her away, again, a lack of something, a nothing in her own place, it's going to restore her virginity Mm. in his own mind. The lack of her will perform this. What am I trying to say here? The restoration of value on the face of it, it's just supposed to be, and by the way, none of this happens. This plan doesn't actually, this is a really interesting plan. It would be really interesting to see it executed, but it doesn't actually happen through the rest of the play. It's not that Claudio says, woe is me, I see what I lost, she must have been innocent. Instead, we can talk about it, but things are resolved actually quite differently. They basically find out who did it. So it's interesting this doesn't, the friar's plan isn't actually carried out. But what he's saying, I think, is really important, which is that some sort of mourning process needs to happen with Claudio. And it's a clue to what was absent Really, the whole play kind of pivots on this seemingly innocent, wonderful moment where Claudio sees Hero and falls in love with her. And it turns out to be quite a sinister thing. And some of that sinister element is revealed in the way he's he's like, well, let's get this, you know, I need to marry her immediately. And he's told, no, you have to wait till Monday. And he's like, what? And that's one of the really interesting things about the play. So something that is seemingly a very romantic moment is actually the sinister thing and then the cow, the, the sort of cynicism of there's something healthier about the cynical interactions of Beatrice and Benedict. Then the question becomes, well, what was missing from that beginning other than the getting to know you process of Beatrice and Benedict? Well, I think the suggestion here is that some sort of mourning was necessary in order to get a true estimation of hero's value. So, as you pointed out, the estimation in the beginning is all just idealization and projection, let's say. She is the representative of every perfect virtue that womankind can possibly have. And, of course, he doesn't know her from Adam. And, again, he's interpreting that off of these outward signs and mannerisms and just typical feminine behavior. And that's what he has to lament and mourn and say goodbye to, because when you actually get to know the person, (laughs) they don't live up to that ideal. And so I think that's part of the significance of what the friar is saying here, is that that's something Claudio will actually have to give up. And so he goes through that whole ritual he's made to, even after they find out the plot, he's kept in the dark, and he and Don Pedro are made to go through that whole ritual where they sing at her supposed grave. Which is an interesting... We could talk about the role of the various songs and the music metaphors in this. But I was thinking, too, the secret that Benedict and and Beatrice knows, being the wiser, 
This is Act 5, Scene 2. They're having a conversation about Claudio, but also about themselves. Beatrice asks Benedict in line uh, 64, but for which of my good parts did you first suffer love for me? And he's, again, of course, immediately reacting to her choice of words. Suffer love, a good epithet. I do suffer love indeed, for I love thee against my will. And Beatrice, in spite of your heart, I think, alas, poor heart, if you spite it for my sake, I will spite it for yours, for I will never love that which my friend hates. And Benedict says, thou and I are too wise to woo peaceably. But they understand that there is that thing that you said that made me made me think of this, of course, is the, you know, the idea of mourning, uh, that Claudia has to go through this process of mourning, that there's an understanding that there is a bittersweet quality to love. And Claudio had to discover the bitter and Beatrice and Benedict already have mostly bitter, <laughs> you know, they could use a little sweetness in their, in their bittersweet. And so they already have this understanding of suffering for, for it as being a major component in love. Therefore, they're too wise to woo peaceably. They understand the battle that has to go on, you know, whether that be true suffering or just the sense of the battle, the skirmish, the idea that you have to fight to overcome maybe your own nature, or as you said earlier, your own sense of individuality, or cede it to the person. Well, also the idealizing component, right? So there's a way in which Hero and Claudio are the very paradigm of what it means to woo peaceably, if peaceably means to engage in this complete idealizing of the other person. So the thing about the fighting, the thing that's built into the whole skirmishing that they're doing is the mourning in the sense that they're pointing out each other's flaws to each other. <laughs> and that's a way of mourning them and accepting them ultimately and making light of them, making them seem less important. So if you woo peaceably and the other person is perfect, then the imperfection when it arrives might be, it could be a life and death matter. I mean, in the case of Hero, right? If it's a lack of chastity, it becomes something that for all Claudio and Leonardo care for, you know, she can die now. She's, she's done. In the last scene, Beatrice and Benedict have, have another great exchange where Beatrice is also masked. Yeah. And comes over to, to Benedict and when he asks, which is Beatrice and says, I answer to that name, what is your will? And he asks, do you not love me? And Beatrice says, why no, no more than reason, which is perhaps true. And then and she asks him the same question, do you not love me? And he says, troth, no, no more than reason, which is, I think, so great because they have found a reasonable way <laughs> right. to, to love each other. So perhaps they don't uh, love each other more than reason, but they respond by saying, no, actually, we are, we do love each other beyond reason because she says, well, then my cousin Margaret and Ursula are much deceived for they did swear you did. So there must be something beyond reason that is involved in, in love that they swore you do love me beyond reason. And Benedict says, they swore you were almost sick for me. Beatrice says, they swore you were well nigh dead for me, which, you know, maybe is a little bit of an insensitive joke to be <laughs> maybe a little a little too soon <laughs> after the um, <laughs> near death of Hero. So Benedict says, then you, you do not love me. And Beatrice says, no, truly, but in friendly recompense. They dance up to each other and then they back away from mm. each other. And so the idea that they understand that love at this point for them is both reasonable and admittedly beyond reason. Mm -hmm. And that is the compromise that they'll make is to admit that they have moved at some point beyond reason in love with each other. Whereas Claudio was always beyond reason and he had to get some reason into him <laughs> in order to be worthy of hero. Yeah. I mean, there's some reflective element there. And in private, right after what's gone down in the church, in private, they admit, and it's a very touching scene, I think, where they suddenly tell each other how much they love each other. It's just such a great contrast <laughs> to all the fighting they've been doing. Granted, it goes dark, you know, Beatrice says, then you got to kill Claudia, but before that. Uh, so what they're doing, partly it's kind of this dancing that they're doing is has something to do with what they're willing to admit in public and the way they're navigating kind of blow to their pride that it is to admit these things in public. The hearsay element still stands, right? Hearsay is, and nothing is what induced them to have these feelings for each other. Although, granted, there had to be some, this seems like there was some real basis for that before. But they've also got, through this other aspect, more combative aspects in their relationship, you know, you get the sense they can see it for what it is and they can have some sort of ironic distance from that. 
feeling as well. So it's not that Beatrice, for instance, or let's say it's not that Benedict is going to believe the things that Claudio believed about Hero. And I don't think there's ever any mention of, I'm not sure there might be one, but Beatrice's chastity, for instance, and there's a few hints about their history, but both of them having previous relationships of some sort, I think. That's what makes me think of Beatrice as being in a, in a similar situation as Hero, actually, because she says, that's why Beatrice says she, she can't go to hell. She has to just lead them to the gate, because hell is not a place for mates. So her presumed chastity there is what makes me think that she's been, gives me this, this idea of a, of a backstory as, as her having been wronged, perhaps, by Benedict prior to the play, because she does maintain her virginity. Yeah. So, but it's, yeah. So I, yeah, I assume that she's a virgin, but <laughs> you, you never know. That's true. But less issue is made of the sort of idealized qualities that are made of with Hero. I think romantic love, it's inherently idealizing, at least in the beginning. But in this case, I think maybe the ironic distance is the way to put this. You know, both of them can get this sort of reflective and humorous and witty distance from their own emotional lives and make fun of it and not simply be take it literally, let's say, speaking of metaphor, not simply take take all of that literally and naively. Mm. The scene that where they do privately profess their love to each other, they, they even use profess as protest their love for each other. Right. In act four. Right, that's perfect. I was about to protest I loved you. And Benedict says, and do it with all thy heart. And she responds, I love you with so much of my heart that none is left to protest. So she uses protest as profess and then as protest. There's also a food metaphor in there too about eating your words. So do we want to talk about Sino more? Yes. Act two. So line two, scene three, line 60, act two, scene three. What's so interesting about Sino no more is that it takes the whole idea of female deception and turns it on its head and, and talks about male deception. So neither sex is to be trusted, I suppose. But the song goes, sigh no more, ladies, sigh no more. Men were deceivers ever. One foot in sea and one on shore, to one thing constant never. Then sigh not so, but let them go, and be you blithe and bonny, converting all your sounds of woe into hey, nonny, nonny. Sing no more ditties, sing no more, of dumps so dull and heavy. The fraud of men was ever so, since summer first was leafy. Then sigh not so, but let them go, and be you blithe and bonny, converting all your sounds of woe into hey, nonny, nonny. The inconstancy of men is skewered here. It's also interesting in light of our talk of mourning, because this is what ladies are being asked to do. So give up these expectations. Mm -hmm. Give up these, you might call them idealizations, if you're to think that women ever idealized men for their constancy. <laughs> but it's a hope, it's a wish. And the song says, convert all your sounds of woe into hey, nani, nani, which my notes say mean careless nothings. And there may be some sexual overtones to it. So the idea that these things, that something that seems so important and essential will be treated as if it's a triviality that one can simply give up. The idea of the song, Benedict is, meanwhile, making fun of this song. They're about to bait Benedict, right, into loving Beatrice at this point. He's hidden and overhearing them. I think he's about to be. Yeah, I think he's hidden. He's hidden at this point. And Benedict says right before this, he ge he gives his own similar prescription for what woman he wants, just as just as Beatrice has given her own, and says, "Well, even still, he'll only win a woman if he can get her goodwill." He gives his own his own prescription for for the woman that he would want. He says, "One woman is fair, yet I am well. Another is wise, yet I am well. Another virtuous, yet I am well. But till all graces be in one woman, one woman shall not come in my grace." And then he says, "She must be rich, wise, virtuous." fair, mild, noble, of good discourse, an excellent musician, and her hair can be uh, whatever color. He doesn't have a preference <laughs> about that. But he's remarking on this. He's saying all of this because he's saying that Claudio is, is so easily taken in by love. And he describes Claudio as being taken in in this way. He says, I have known when there was no music with him, but the drum and the fife. Now he had rather hear the tabor and the pipe. So 
there used to be battle music in him, but now he's he's just listening to this pleasant, you know, romantic music, not the martial music of the drum and the five. So now he has music in him. And then the song that immediately follows is one that talks about what deceivers men are. I wanted to maybe address the, just a little bit from the Auden essay. Auden has this great essay in the essay collection, The Dyer's Hand, where he talks about music and music's role in Much Ado and As You Like It in Twelfth Night. And he says, Benedict laughs at the thought of the lovesick Claudio and congratulates himself on being heart whole, expresses their contrasted states in a musical imagery. And he gives this no music with him, quote, We, of course, know that Benedict is not as heart whole as he is trying to pretend. Beatrice and Benedict resist each other because being both proud and intelligent, they do not wish to be the helpless slaves of emotion, or worse, to become what they have often observed in others, the victims of an imaginary passion. Claudio, for his part, wishes to hear music because he is in a dreamy, lovesick state, but he doesn't notice that the mood and words of the song are in complete contrast to his daydream. The song is actually about the irresponsibility of men and the folly of women taking them seriously, and it recommends as an antidote good humor and common sense which is exactly what, what Beatrice has. And then he goes on to talk about Claudio, who who is all too willing to believe the slander against Hero. And, and Auden says of Claudio, he falls into the trap set for him because as yet he is less a lover than a man in love with love. Hero is as yet more an image in his own mind than a real person, and such images are susceptible to every suggestion. For Claudio, the song marks the moment when his pleasant illusions about himself as a lover are at their highest. Before he can really listen to music, he must be cured of imaginary listening. Hmm. And the cure lies through the disharmonious experiences of passion and guilt. So again, that curing him of, of an image is paired with the curing him of the false music or of hearing the music properly, actually listening to the words of the song <laughs> instead of getting caught up in the tune. Hmm. Auden's so good. Yeah, I love that. So right before the song, I was just going to point to the whole note notes stuff. There's not a note of mine that's worth the note. <laughs> note notes for sooth and nothing. It does get at the noting nothing pun, which hopefully we mentioned that those two words would have sounded the same. They would have been pronounced the same, like noting would have been the way nothing was pronounced. And so that's part of the, the pun would be very natural. It's, I love Benedict saying, uh, now is his soul ravished. Is it not strange that sheep's guts should hail souls out of men's bodies? I love that he looks at the instrument for for what it is, which is sheep's guts. Right. <laughs> he sees the he sees beyond the the noise it makes to what it actually is, which is just a bodily organ. And it's just yet another parallel to the idea that these deep passions can be elicited by the notes being themselves trivial or, or at the level of appearance and hidden behind them could be just guts. Mm. And yet our passions are predicated on the notes not the fact that underneath <laughs> are the guts in the case of lovers you know their outward mannerisms and appearances and if we could see their guts it would be a different matter and you know stomach and all of that is you know related to eating and and when don john references his stomach or benedict saying that she has meat food to feed her gut as senior benedict the recognition of the animal nature maybe, of love at its base or, or of the lust that he's seeing through the fog to get to is the same thing as looking at an instrument and not, not hearing the, the melodious sound it makes, but realizing that it's just guts. It's just the body, the response, and, and which Benedict thinks he's, he's sort of a master over, that he understands that love is just like something physical, something bodily, it has no control over him. And that's why he's a confirmed bachelor and he loves no woman and doesn't need to love. So until he can sort of hear the music and not just see the sheep's gut, he's going to be lost. And until Claudio can see the fact that there's guts there, <laughs> they're not quite ready to be married. So we should say a little bit about Dogberry and his men, I think. Yes. Malapropisms, um, <laughs> which is also kind of a fitting fool to have in this particular play, to have the fool speak malapropisms all the time. Yeah, and he's a representative of the law, so you get the sense he's trying to be very officious and speak. He's a lower class fellow, and he gets into trouble verbally because he's trying to speak in jargon or in a language he doesn't really 
fully understand, you get the sense. So often the words that are coming out of his mouth are just the opposite of what, <laughs> what he means. So for instance, he tells his men, this is your charge, you shall comprehend all vagram men, comprehend instead of apprehend. And that's telling. And it's funny, the other examples come later. I'm right now, I'm in the, where we first see him in act three, scene three. Who think you the most desertless man to be constable <laughs> instead of deserving? So the other interesting thing here is the sort of what I in my notes call tautologous justice, where his deputies, basically the people he's deputizing to keep watch at night, are asking him what they should do if people won't obey them. So at line 27, after he's told them to comprehend all vagram men, and Seacole says, how if it will not stand? And then Dogberry, why then, take no note of him, but let him go and presently call the rest of the watch together and thank God you are rid of a knave. And if you find a thief, don't mess with him because it's possible you don't want to hang out with thieves lest you become dishonest yourself. <laughs> and let him steal out of your company. Let him show himself what he is and steal out of your company. So in each case, when you encounter criminals, instead of imposing the force of the law upon them, they, by virtue of being criminals, are no longer within your jurisdiction. They're incompatible with the law, and the law could be hurt or undermined by coming into contact with them. So you simply evade them. You let them just do what they're going to do. <laughs> And that's a really fascinating little thing to have going on in this play. This whole idea about a person who's a representative of the law who has all these problems around use of language and these bizarre reasonings about how the law, the law is supposed to work. Yeah, I mean, if we could connect that more to what's going on in the, in the plot about law, there's a deeper connection there that I want to make clear. Just skipping up a few lines when he says, if you meet a thief, you may suspect him by virtue of your office to be no true man. And for such kind of men, the less you meddle or make with them, why the more is for your honesty. You may suspect him by virtue of your office to be no true man. So again, there's this idea that because he is an officer of the law, he will know by virtue of his office. So he will know because he is an officer of the law who is not following the law. Again, it's about this predicament that we have of figuring out who the culprit is whether or who people really are. So when you're in love with them, are you in love with some outer appearance or that's, you know, are they misrepresenting themselves? You know, it's a similar idea here, what you are to, how you are to identify and deal with malefactors who ultimately end up being the people that they apprehend will be the servants of Don John, one of whom Baraccio has just come back from making it seem like Hero is unchaste. Yeah, I like when he says, I think they that touch pitch will be defiled. Right. We could tell the people with dirty hands because they've stuck their hands in pitch and gotten their hands dirty. We could see if they're guilty by seeing if they've gotten their hands dirty. It's just using one literal expression of having unclean hands <laughs> as a way to say that he has unclean hands. You can just tell by looking at him because his hands will be dirty. And so you should just let him be himself. And that is that he is a thief. Truly, you're by your office you may, but I think that touch pitch will be defiled. I took him to be saying here, you don't want to apprehend the thief because you could be defiled by touching him. The most peaceable way for you, if you do take a thief, is to let him show him, and then where take now means see, is to let him show himself that what he is and steal out of your company. So... Instead of actually apprehending him and touching him and so being defiled by him, you take him in the sense of you register his presence, you look at him, but then you let him disappear. Show himself what he is and then disappear. So, which is really fascinating. I mean, this is some, there's got to be something very important going on here. Some of this has to do with the mode of suspicion is kind of undermining so um, as legal authorities they have to be they have to go around looking for bad people but the idea here is that it could make them bad and you see i think in the malproprism you see this the way the words are all these inversions where uh let's go back to an example 
you know, where desertless man is meant to mean deserving man, I think that reflects the same sort of dynamic. In other words, the constables are the ones supposed to be finding the undeserving ones or the malefactors. And so the reversal puts that quality onto the constables themselves. And I think that's pretty much the way it goes throughout. Indeed comprehended So, at 43. One word, sir, our watch, sir, have indeed comprehended two auspicious persons. So comprehended instead of apprehended. Again, this movement where comprehend instead of touching and being defiled by, it's, you know, you you maintain a, a distance. And then auspicious is almost, uh, he means suspicious, but it looks almost like auspicious. Even before that, on in the earliest part, uh, Leonardo says, what would you with me, honest neighbor? Dogberry says, Mary, sir, I would have some confidence with you that discerns you nearly. Right. So discerns for concerns, but it does discern him. There, there's the, you know, the, the Yogi Berra kind of logic in everything that he says. Let's look at some examples from where you were going in, in Act 4. He identifies himself as the sexton asks, which ones are the malefactors? Yeah. Which be the malefactors? And Dog Bear says, Mary, that am I and my partner. So he, he misidentifies right. himself as the malefactor. And Virgis says, nay, that's certain we have the exhibition to examine. So yeah, so we've been commissioned to examine this case. And Sexton says, but which are the offenders that are to be examined? Let them come before Master Constable. Yay, Mary, let them come before me. And then this great long lines that he, have, he has, write down that they hope they serve God and write God first. For God defend, but God should go before such villains. So, you know, we have to put God before, before criminals. And then he, he says, Masters, it's been, it is proved already that you are a little better than false knaves, and it will go near to be thought so shortly. So soon we'll know, we'll know for certain. How do you answer for yourselves? And they say, no, we're, we're not. Uh, we are none. What I'm interested in is the writing things down and then saying that it's perjurous to write down what he actually says. <laughs> this man said, sir, that Don John, the prince's brother, was a villain. Dogberry says, write down Prince John a villain. Why? This is flat perjury to call Prince's brother villain. Well, we're trying to get at all these different confusions and the significance of them. It's within the theme of appearances versus reality, words versus reality. And there's, there's even the point where he's been called an ass. And instead of saying, remember that I was called an ass because he wants the person to be punished, he says, remember that I am an ass. So this confusion between... <laughs> use and mention of words is what philosophers would say, but between things as they are reported and things as they are and between like, you know, so let them be opinioned instead of let them be pinioned. Where pinioning would be you put in cuffs, I think. Kind of confusion between words that represent mental states and words that represent actions and confusion about who the constable is, who the administ administrator of the law is, and who is the subject of the law. So who's the malefactor and who's not. And there's something there about what goes on when we're evaluating lovers. And you mentioned projection earlier on, and the confusion about, first of all, the signifier and reality, appearance and reality, but, and then also confusion about what comes from the lover in their assessment of the beloved and what actually is there in the beloved, even possible reversals. So the kind of reversals that Dogberry is doing, I forget what play this is in, but there's another Shakespeare play where he makes fun of this sort of thing. You take the worst traits of someone and you can turn them into their biggest virtues. So this is what Freud would call overvaluation of the object, which is we idealize and we even take the things which are obviously flaws and we say, oh, that just makes them so much better. That crooked smile that she has is amazing. There may be some relation between Dogberry's confusions and the way the law is being applied and, and the way we assess lovers. And of course, it all does. There, there is a legal element in the end, right? When the, Because the stakes are high with Hero, she's put on a kind of trial at her wedding. And the trial, as I've pointed out, the, the evidence is all metaphor. The evidence is just, oh, I imagine that she's stained now. And it's hearsay. These people said it happened. And these sort of evidentiary confusions and this conflation of metaphorical reasoning 
with actual reasoning in order to figure out if some someone has done something wrong. I think they're sort of reflected in Dogberry and Dogberry's men. And yet, they are the ones who, despite those confusions, who can see what's in front of their face, right? They immediately catch the plotters. Unfortunately, they're not good at communicating that, and they go to Leonardo because they're so convoluted and ridiculous. And he's rushing to the wedding. He gets away from them before they can tell him what's happened. At least they know, unlike the other characters who should, should have known better, who should have known that Don John was not trustworthy and they were given, he lied to them once and then they, nothing came of that and they, and then he, they let them lie to him again. So is this the case of the, you know, the simplest being therefore the most receptive? Because Dogberry isn't inventing, he's seeing things as they are merely because he doesn't have the capability of, of inventing some sort of falsehood or some sort of false narrative or projection in his mind. Yeah, I think that could be part of it. You know, that's a kind of a, a trope, I guess, you know, the, is the simplicity, a kind of lower class simplicity and lack of sophistication, which allows him to see the world as it is um, and to... The upper class world here is is far more focused on and cued into signifiers and appearances. So, you know, apparel, for instance, as a, I don't know if cued into is the right word, but more focused on it. So the, the sorts of things that convey kind of clothing, for instance, that would convey your class, the stakes are higher for people in the upper classes, so they would never wear. And there's even that whole dialogue about the sorts of people, the deformed, right? The sorts of people who pretend to be upper class by wearing different clothing. Yeah, I was just thinking that. It's all associated with with images in paintings, fashioning them like Pharaoh's soldiers in the Ricci painting, sometime like God, Bell's priests in the old church window, sometime like the shaven Hercules in the smirched worm-eaten tapestry, all of these images of people rather than actual people. Yeah, again, the importance of outward appearance as a signifier meant, you know, something that signifies something more essential. And But again, it's hearsay. So the apparel is also hearsay and it could easily be wrong. And Boratio says, that shows thou art unconfirmed, right? Innocent. Thou knowest that the fashion of a doublet or a hat or a cloak is nothing to a man. Mm-hmm. It doesn't actually reveal his, his actual character, but he says nothing right. to a man. The outward appearance is, rather than the interior being a no thing, the outward appearance is also mm. a no thing, regardless of how you, how you dress it up. Yeah, there's so much that's going on in this play, and we only got it a very small amount of it and a small amount of the text, but hopefully we've given a good example of some of the, the richness of this. So, you know, like just the way we, we ended there with Dogberry and his men, the, it's more than comic relief, right? Shakespeare is giving us more tools to think about. Shakespeare is a is a thinker as well, and you see him thinking through certain things in his plays, and it's part of what makes it so exciting. The sorts of scenes with Dogberry are no, thematically, they're not just accidental. They're not accidentally connected. They're well thought out. And there's a lot more to say about it. Absolutely. It's been so long since I've I had seen this play, and I think I saw a production. I have a friend who used to produce and direct plays in New York, just sort of community theater, Shakespeare in New York City. And I think that was the last time, a long time ago, I'm not going to say how long, I actually had seen Much Ado About Nothing. So I I saw it live. And so I remembered practically nothing except for Dogberry. How crazy is that? So just in my my closing here, I mean, I, I could... Virtually any Shakespeare play, I'd be raving about it and talking about how ex- exciting it was. But each, what's weird is each each play is so different. It almost feels like it's by a different writer in some ways, but it's also quintessentially Shakespeare at the same time. I don't know how to explain that. So I'm always surprised. That's There's always this novelty, and it's not just novelty of a new plot. It's someone who's experimenting, just doing new and different things with their writing. And as, as I said before, thinking through interesting puzzles uh, in this creative way. So it's always just, for, for me, it's like watching and reading Shakespeare is just like injecting heroin into my veins. I'm always just put into this state <laughs> of complete euphoria. And I'm, I'm serious. It's, uh, it's a euphoric feeling. And I can't 
if you ask me, well, how do you compare this to other, you know, I would, I've always said that my favorite play is The Tempest. It's impossible for me to compare it to the euphoria that I get from any other Shakespeare play because they're always euphoric experiences, but always so different. I mean, one thing about Much Ado About Nothing is the, you know, it's not known one, as one of his problem plays. And I think there's always an undercurrent of tragedy in any comedy. And Shakespeare always does that well. Here, it's more obvious. You know, there's a, this more shocking and clear transition into this. It, it, there's a sort of counterplot at work. I'm thinking of, you know, if Beatrice and Benedict were treated as the main, if their story were treated as the, the actual plot, you think of Claudio and Hero as a kind of tragic counterplot. And the two are intertwined and, of course, depend on each other. So it's, uh, I don't know how to explain it it's um it's this very even mix of the tragic and comic it's very balanced i don't know i don't know what else to say but it's it's perfect but (laughs) it's one of many different types of perfection that that shakespeare gives us so i'm so familiar with this play I love Much Ado. It's my favorite comedy of Shakespeare's. And yet I always go into it thinking that this is going to be a play about Beatrice and Benedict. And I'm always surprised when it's actually a play about Hero and Claudio more than about Beatrice and Benedict. Wait, are you reversing that? No. Okay. I, th- I don't think so. It's more about Hero and Claudio than... Yeah, I think I think so. I mean, you know, in terms of uh, time on stage or whatever, I mean, I think that there's an even amount of time probably but i don't think of the couples as sharing an even amount of time i think of it as being beatrice and benedict's play and then i'm always surprised to see that it's actually more about about claudio and hero i mean in terms of like the mechanism of the plot i think it's more about claudio and and hero would you agree with that the way i think of it it is nominally the hero and and heroine are claudio and hero (laughs) strangely enough (laughs) right and, and Benedict and Beatrice are sort of the show-stealing, supporting actors. So that's the common, I think, way of looking at it. But I think you're turning that on its head. You know, but now we all come to it with the expectation that these guys are the show-stealers, but you're, you're returning us to the, the fact that, yeah. Yes. Yeah, it's sort of, you know, the, the Beatrice and Benedict, I guess you could say that the romantic comedy convention nowadays would be that the more jaded, slightly older couple would be the best friend of the main characters and the side plot. And the Claudio hero relationship is admittedly, you know, much less interesting. I think in terms of the love between them uh, is much less interesting. And they're shallower characters in a way because of their idealizing and naive approach to things. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and so, so in, in closing, what I wanted to say was just that after having this conversation, I, I wonder if I'm now going to look at their relationship with new appreciation, not with the teenage excitement I got at, uh, from the sparring between Beatrice and, and Benedict and only wanting to read those parts of the play and watch those parts of the adaptations, but to recognize that those parts are, are maybe the sweeter if we're being thrown into relief by the Claudio and Hero uh, romance that the two of them are actually much more interdependent than I had had previously thought. I mean, of course, there's a relation there, but the, the relation is much more essential than it is proximate. And that's all I have to say. Great. Well, thank you. I enjoyed that. Good night. Good night, everyone. And thank you to everyone who listened to this episode. I just wanted to say that if you're listening to this on the feed for the Partially Examined Life, you're not yet subscribed. You should subscribe to us directly by searching for us on the podcast app of your choice. And if you like us, a rating or review would help a lot. You can also find us at subtextpodcast.com, where you can subscribe to our email newsletter. To get ad-free episodes and a variety of bonus content, please subscribe at patreon.com slash subtext. Bonus content will include our after show, which we're calling Postscript, which consists of an extra 15 minutes of discussion following the regular episode. Sometimes we'll continue talking about the topic for that week. Sometimes we'll discuss what else we've been reading, writing, and thinking about. When the time comes, we'll be responding to listener emails. And sometimes we'll talk a little bit about ourselves. Subscribing will also get you the occasional full bonus show and several prequel episodes that I did with various guests. Send your feedback and episode requests to letters at subtextpodcast.com. You'll also find us on Facebook at Subtext Podcast and on Twitter at Enjoy Subtext. And once again, thank you for listening.